Okay. I'm Jason Lavalley with Psychedelic Scene, and I'm here talking to James Lowe, the vocalist, guitar player, and frontman for the Electric Prunes. James, thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Of course. Now, your first album came out in April of 1967. How old were you at the time? Oh, God. I know you're going to ask me that. I don't know. I was like 20, 22 or something like that. Okay. So pretty young. Pretty then, young, yeah. I, I had too much to dream last night, which was a number 11 hit in the U.S. in 1967. Uh, what was it like to have a, a hit record at that age? Well, we had we had been trying to have a hit record, so it wasn't like it came as a total surprise. Well, it, of course, having it did, but not the attempt at having it. We recorded it in 66, and we had put out one other record called Ain't It Hard, and it didn't do anything. So when we put out Too Much to Dream, we just expected the same thing. No, nothing will come of it. And then things started happening with it that just kind of lit the fire, you know. So uh, what did it feel like? It felt like, I'll tell you, I've often said this, when we heard it on the radio the first time, we stopped the car and everybody got out and started punching each other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> I don't know. It felt good. It felt good. I'll, yeah, I'll bet. Yep. Uh, you guys were known as a psychedelic band, of course. Um, were you guys uh, using psychedelic substances? Well, I, I think maybe some of us were, but it wasn't the core of the band. We didn't get high and sit in there and record and stuff. It it wasn't like that. The people that uh, that did use any substances used it on their own and sort of apart from the band. We didn't make it a part of the music or a part of the band, even though people associate it with that. Right. I mean, the sound and the lyrics uh, both seem to reflect a, a psychedelic vibe. Well, they didn't know it. That word didn't exist then. See, when we started doing it, all of a sudden the word psychedelic popped up and then every woman was going to Orbox and, in LA and buying a psychedelic dress and <laughs> it oh, well, became but, sort of commercialized, you know? Well, the, I'm pretty sure the word existed. It just may not have been part of the vernacular at the time. Maybe, maybe. Uh, so you came out with a second album that uh, didn't do quite as well as the first. It didn't, it didn't. yeah. Uh, go go our ahead. Produce, our producer was off... Uh, Dave Hassinger was off doing a Grateful Dead album because our thing became a hit. He got to do the Grateful Dead. So he went to San Francisco. He was doing the Grateful Dead album and we were working on Underground, our second album. And uh, so he, he didn't have much involvement in that. He, and he told me when he, when he came back that it was terrible and that I would be, uh, that would be it, you know, so. I got the authorization from him to 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 try and hate it, but try I didn't. Hate it? Try and hate hate the you know trying to say well I don't like it either you know, but I but I like some things on there and uh, it was more of us more just us doing what we wanted to do. So okay. it, wasn't, it wasn't about hit records at that time. See, everybody was trying to get to have every, have the Beatles, you know, everybody was trying to be the Beatles and the record companies were trying to sign that group that was going to give them 15 hits in a row. And, right. and for me, it didn't, that isn't what we got into it for. We got into right. it. Well, the, the second program. record allowed for more self-expression, like you got to contribute more of your own songs. Right. We did. Yeah. So it was more satisfactory in that way, I imagine. Yes, it was very much. Yeah. So the third album, which I, I actually know some people that have a, a great fondness for, uh, Mass in F minor, was a little strange because it was, uh, it had a religious theme, I think, and it was sung in Latin and Spanish. Right. What, in Latin. What, what made you agree to do that album? 
Well, I had been an altar boy and I knew the whole mass in Latin. So I thought, Latin? Wow, that's weird. And uh, Dave Axelrod was a good guy. We w went and rehearsed with him and, you know, Mark and I uh, talked through the whole thing a number of times. It didn't come out exactly like what we had talked about, but I thought it was a good, my mom would really like that, you know, that I was doing a Catholic mass, being from a Catholic family. It, it, and it sort of got rid of the too much to dream psychedelic uh, function. And uh, so I thought, well, what the hell? Can't, it, there's a lot of other things recorded that that you wouldn't think would be. And um, and so we, that's the reason we did the project. Yeah. And he was managed by our manager. Uh, uh, Dave Axelrod was managed by our manager. Well, what was it like working with David Axelrod. Well, he was the guy that stepped up and went tap, tap, tap. And then the, or the band started playing, you know, we, we were a garage band. We didn't know anything about that, you know. He, right. So it was yeah. kind of like a, a, an orchestra conductor con trying to conduct a garage band. Exactly. The cultural <laughs> shock for us. But, but we lived with it. We got through it. Uh, we, we expected we were going to be left some freedom at the end to put some of our ideas in there, you know, but we, it was all charted and everything. There's no, you know, there's no place in there to put your, your thing in if you want it. And uh, we were actually in Europe when it came out. I didn't even know they were going to put it out. And it came out when we were over in, in uh, England. And then one of the, I think the lead track, Kyrie Ellison or something, got, got picked up for the movie Easy Rider, which gave it a kind of a, a new life. Right. And people considered it must be cool if, uh, you know, if those guys, I don't know why they picked it. it. I never found that out. And I never got paid for it. So wow. uh, uh, it's double whammy. <laughs> well, you know, you, I, I, uh, I recently posted something on the Psychedelic Scene Facebook page about your lawsuit in 2004, 20 years ago, concerning royalties owed to you by the music publishing company and the label. Uh, was that part of that? Um, what, what can you tell me about that? This was when, in 2004? Yes. Um, well, yeah, we probably did file some stuff. Mark would handle all of that stuff. I had nothing to do with it. So I, we probably did. We got, uh, we never gave the name away. I never signed off on the name. Uh, Dave Hassinger's wife asked me if they could use it. And I said, sure, why not? I'm not going to use it. So, um, but they never had the rights to the name. They just, they used it as many people have. <laughs> Oh, so they used the the name, the Electric Prunes, but didn't pay you for the royalties that came from. You did get paid for the work that you did on the original three albums. Uh, yeah, I guess we did. Yeah, no, the thing was that the, Dave Hassinger was in the middle of all this. We weren't signed directly to Reprise. We were signed to him and he signed on to Reprise. And like the... Uh, the Dunhill album of Easy Rider, uh, they owed us $10,000 for that. The last time I saw Dave, he said, oh, Ma Maureen spent it, his, his ex then ex-wife. He said, oh, she she got the money and spent it. So <laughs> so what are you going to do? And then she was dead by the time that, that he told me that. So there wasn't any way to go ask her for it. Oh, huh. well, that's... Uh, that's uh... An unusual we never, story. We never did all this for the money anyway. So it was, you know, when it became boring and and, and uh, we felt like we were being used and we didn't make any money, that's when I, we all quit. Right. You know, there, there's there been a, a renaissance, a renewal of interest in psychedelic music uh, over the past, you know, 15 years or so in particular. Um, has that resulted in uh, revenue for you? And uh, I mean, has that, I, I assume that, you know, the electric prunes are getting streamed quite a bit and so forth. Um, well, we get something from it. Have yeah. You, yeah. Have you noticed any kind of a 
like a, a bump in Royal Yeah, there's there certainly there was a bump. We came back and reformed in uh, 2000. And Stephen Van Zant was probably the key issue in that. He kind of dared me to come out in, in, to New York and play and would bring the band out there. So w- once we started doing that, then we started because I had a studio, we started recording more things. And if you look, you'll see there's probably five albums that we did after that, just because it was construction. We want Mark and I wanted to do that. Yeah. Um, and and uh, I think we've gotten as much notice as we deserve, you know. OK. Some people know us. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You, you left after the third Hello, album. Jason, you're frozen. Right? Huh? Oh, I guess I stumped him with that one. Yeah, I, I, we're having a little bit of a connection issue. Um, maybe it's the dis- no audio. No can audio. I oh. can't hear your voice. Okay, let me. Uh, let My me... internet connection. Okay, I'm gonna put this in the chat then. Okay, I got you now. Oh, you, you can hear me. Yep, got gotcha. you. Right, great. So you left the band after the third album came out, right? Right. And then uh, Kenny Loggins was briefly in the band. Uh-huh. <laughs> Did you ever cross paths with him? Yeah, I used to see him every once in a while. Yeah, I went down and saw him. In fact, they invited me to PJ's where they did the presentation of the act or whatever, you know. I went down there and saw him. <clears throat> yeah. So you saw sure. Kenny Loggins perform with your old band? Yeah. <laughs> but he didn't play he didn't play a, the role you think he would, you know. He didn't step up there like the center, you know. He was sort of off to the side a little bit and right. sort of add, right. adding his great stuff. He was unknown at the time, of course. He he was. Yeah. Mark Mark thought he was the best guy he ever played with. He he, he really liked him. Uh-huh. Okay. Um, after leaving the prunes, you worked with uh, Todd Rundgren and the Naz. Uh, right. It was Todd Rundgren's late '60s psych band. Um, how did you connect with with that group and Todd Rundgren in particular? Uh, they came to a studio that I was uh, engineering some things at, and Todd and I got to talking in the uh, in the lobby. And uh, his manager, John, I can't remember his name, John something or other, uh, uh, kind of hooked us up and said, you guys should work together. So I was working with uh, Van Dyke Parks and some other people that t- Todd liked. <laughs> so uh, their, their engineer back, back in the East Coast couldn't stay awake for their recording. So all the requirement was was that I would stay awake. So uh, we started recording at ID Sound, and we did, gee, we must have done five albums there, four or five albums. And then we did an album with Hunt and Tony Sales. Oh, yeah. Soupy Sales' the Sons. Yeah. They're they're still my close friends. <laughs> oh, yeah? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we um, made an unbreakable bond on that record. <laughs> how, how's that? And Utopia. They Todd put together Utopia, you know, they were in Utopia. And I went back there to the East Coast. Albert Grossman brought me back there and we were going to do all these live shows and everything. But I ended up leaving before that started. We did a few things, but not like we were supposed to. Okay. I know one of those guys, at least one of those guys played in Tin Machine with David Bowie, too. Yes, they both did. Hunt, Hunt played drums and Tony played bass. All right. Yeah, David Bowie really liked Tony. He thought he he thought he was a star. Okay. Uh, what's your favorite memory of, of being in the Electric Prunes? Hmm. I would say probably uh, probably playing with Cream in L.A. at the, the L.A. I don't know, was Sports Center or whatever it was, some some place that we played. Uh, that was a great night. That's one I, I remember for a long time. Stephen Wolf, Cream. Uh, I don't remember who else, but it was it was a good night. So you guys opened for those acts? We uh, 
we were right before cream. So Steppenwolf and whoever it was opened for us. Yeah. yeah. Well, that sounds like a great show. It was cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the electric prunes are still active, right? <laughs> well, I mean, they have been until right now. <laughs> you just ended the band just now. I'm uh, well. I'm gonna. We're gonna give up the ghosts. The band members don't know it yet, but we're. Uh, when Mark was playing uh, with, he was he was playing with Billy Corrigan on his live dates. He would play bass for him on the live dates, and he came to me and said, "Hey, Billy wrote a song for us." So I uh, okay, right? So I went to uh, Kerry Brown's studio and. And sure enough, it was a song. And I thought, well, you know what? Uh, we should record it. So we recorded that song uh, and uh, another one, a B-side by him. So I've had these things all this time and I've never done anything with them. And I thought that should be our last recording because my son has a band called Jesus Mind Glaze. And the song is called Jesus Needs a Hit. And I thought, it, nothing could fit my boy better or us better or whatever. And I just think we should turn it over to younger guys now, you know. I'm I'm uh, creaking everywhere. I see. <laughs> I still so, enjoy doing it, but I uh, but but I'm creaky. Well, I mean, isn't enjoying it what it's all about? Well, yeah, it is. It's about having fun with it. Right. And I'm still having fun, but it's just uh time to move on you know you sort of know when it is but we will put out uh, this one cd which will just be a 45 you know of uh, jesus needs a hit and, and and uh and medicine the other song wait what do you mean i thought that was your son's band that had that song no that was i i said i would record this because my son has a band called jesus mind glaze oh i see i I think Jesus needs a hit, so I said, I said I'm going to record this. You're going to you're going to have the last thing the Electric Prunes recorded, and uh, I'm going to I'm going to put it out for him. You know, hoping that he finds that hit. Okay, all right. Um, uh, you mentioned uh, before that you're now in the Dominican Republic. Are you right. living there full time? No, I live here part time. I I bought. A house down here 35 years ago and uh, I've been coming here ever since I love this place okay kite surfing surfing it's uh, you know perfect well since you are ending effectively the electric prunes what are you going to do now uh probably nothing <laughs> I don't know I have a lot of interests I like making films I like you know, I've, I've done a lot of things. So I think probably uh, uh, try to find some way to help other people, to help other guys that are trying to do what I did, you know. Uh -huh. I, I find there's a lot of interest in that. People say, how do you do this? And how's that? How does that work? So maybe I can put a voice in there and, and help them out. Well, that's very noble. Yeah, it sounds good anyway. <laughs> <laughs> All right, James. Well, that's about all I've got for you. Um, if, if, do you have any anything that you want to share before we go our separate ways? Well, the one thing I would like to, to say is that we thank everyone who ever listened to us. I mean, I, I know what it's like to listen to a band or to hear a band, you know, and uh, enough people, not magnanimous like an enormous group, but just for a little group from Woodland Hills, a lot of people listen to us and that's very cool and we certainly thank them all and thank the, the people that write to us and ask about things we thank them all for being there great uh, one little thing i'm going to say is that uh i i love the song oni which i think is uh, an underappreciated one but it's always been one of my favorite songs of of the bands you know a lot of people like that song that that song was written by nancy mance to her daughter Oh. who was kind of going astray or something, I think, you know? And so she she wrote that song for her. Wow. Well, that's interesting. I'm going to have to li listen to it from that perspective. Good idea. <laughs> All right, James. Well, thank you so much for taking the time. I really appreciate it. 
Well, thank you very much for asking, Jason. <laughs> and you go on and have a great, great day. Thanks. You do the same. Okay. Ciao. Ciao.